So the main outcome of COP26 was that over 200 countries have signed up to the Glasgow Climate Pact, which commits us to keeping on track to not increasing global temperatures more than 1.5 degrees. The text itself of the pact is really very progressive. And I think the most notable thing in it is that for the first time in 30 years of UN diplomacy on this issue, 200 countries have agreed that coal is the main problem and that we need to take action together as the world. We also saw a number of really good sub agreements on key issues from gender to youth engagement to agriculture, forestation, and really good uh, commitments on finance and mitigation. So one of the key elements that was agreed in Glasgow was that the Paris rule book was finally agreed. And that actually puts in place the systems and processes that are needed to deliver the Paris commitments of 1.5 degrees. We also saw commitments on finance, mitigation and adaptation. On finance, it was really quite an exciting outcome. Uh, previously, the world had committed to try to raise $100 billion a year for developing countries to adapt to climate change. That commitment has now been lifted with the aim of from 2025, looking at $1 trillion a year. Um, we also have seen commitments come back next year at COP to look at how countries are delivering against their 2030 uh, emissions targets and committing to do more to deliver them quicker and at a more ambitious rate. It's a great commitment and it's incredibly important. And we've seen some of the risks to our forests, whether it's from illegal logging, uh, whether it's from mass agriculture, or whether it's from situations like uh, here in North Macedonia this summer and in the region where we saw the devastating forest fires. So we need to see actions at the local level. We need to see actions at the government level. That's transparent and accountable strategies for maintaining the forests, it's tackling the corruption and some of the illegal activities around uh, logging and really corrupt behaviours we've seen in the past. There has been agreements before on forestation, but they've never had the level of funding that this agreement has. We're looking at $19.2 billion worldwide to tackle this problem for developing countries. And I think that really will make a difference in what we can hope to achieve over the coming years. The first thing was, it was a really good announcement on the 2nd of November by uh, certain countries that they would uh, sign up to this methane agreement and the United Kingdom was very proud to be one of the first signatories. So of the countries that signed up, it's 50% of the world's methane emissions. So that in itself is a huge commitment and should have a real impact. But there are countries that we also need to commit. We need to persuade them of the science, that what the scientists say is right. We need to show them that actually through technological changes, those countries that have already signed up are able to make the changes without negative economic impact and where funding is needed, that it is available for adaptation. I think you're absolutely right. These, uh, the tragedies we've seen, the forest fires here this summer, flooding in other parts of Europe, flooding here five years ago, these natural disasters are related to climate changes. And I think they are coming home to people of the impacts. I talked to, for example, the owners of wineries here who are seeing the changing weather patterns and the impact on their produce. So people are seeing a risk to life 
through natural disaster and a risk to their economic livelihoods. So local authorities need to have really, really good resilience and crisis plans. And actually, we're working with a number of municipalities at the moment on a pilot project on preparing crisis resilience, having the strategies in place and the work uh, that's needed with fed government authorities as well so that we can respond quickly should such disasters continue to happen in the future. We have committed to a really ambitious strategy, you know, setting us on the way to net zero by 2050. We were the first country in the world to actually legislate. So we've said that we have to do this and we have to enforce it. Um, so there are some key points and targets along the way that we have to meet, meet. So we have to remove all use of fossil fuels by 2030. We have to use different vehicles by 2030. We've committed to getting gas boilers out of people's houses uh, by 2035. So what we need really now is to put money into it and to actually make sure that our budgets for each of the years going forward from now until 2035 actually allow us to implement the strategies because the strategies are the right ones, but you just have to do it. Obviously, that was disappointing. We would have hoped that all countries around the world would have already put forward net zero commitments by now. Um, there was agreement to come back next year and look at everybody's net zero commitments. So there's another opportunity for countries to come forward and do so. But we have made progress. All countries now accept that the climate is changing. And there is also an acceptance of the science behind that now, that the reason the climate is changing is man-made. That's new. We weren't in that place a couple of years ago. We didn't have those, that opinion from Russia. We weren't seeing that position from China. So that's the first step. We accept the science. The next step is to prove to other countries that we can actually make the changes and continue to grow our economies successfully that we can make the new technologies work, that we can find alternate and effective sources of energy. And that's going to be on all of us to put the funding and the effort in to show other countries that it's worth making these changes. I think, first of all, North Macedonia has come forward with a really ambitious set of commitments, but it's underpinned those with actual strategies of how it's going to deliver them. So with the climate strategy, with the energy strategy, which we were very pleased to support the help of the uh, preparation of the strategy and the implementation, because actually the country isn't going to be able to change without moving to new renewable sources of energy, which don't damage the environment. And that's going to be very difficult and it's going to need the financial support that we've already discussed. The other thing that North Macedonia is working on is a 20-year development strategy, so the National Development Strategy, which we've also been happy to support. And what that does is put in place the building blocks across a whole range of areas of work that are needed to actually really deliver on this ambitious plan. Obviously, the UK has taken a number of measures over the last year, some of which are relevant just to the UK, but actually there's a lot which are relevant here. So, for example, in the last couple of weeks, working with UNDP, we've opened a new skills centre in Tetabo, um, and that's working with Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, training people up in new skills in the construction industry. So bringing together the green agenda, but also a positive economic agenda as well. Um, we've in the past had a twinning project 
looking at how to do waste management and looking at some of the techniques we've used. And there are now new waste management laws here in North Macedonia, which will hopefully enable North Macedonia to improve its waste management uh, and take it into the 21st century. Um, and also the UK has, over the last uh, 10, 20 years, really developed our legislation in these areas. And we're now working with the Ministry of the Environment on how to improve the legislation here to both improve it and to make sure it's implemented. So one thing that's always struck me since I've been here is in fact there's a lot of people who are really committed and enthused on the environment, particularly young people who really have campaigned on it and are looking for change. Um, but actually, I have seen change in the few years since I've been here and one good example is the Clear It Up project run by the Institute, Institute for Communication Studies. So that brought together academics, civil society organisations, media, uh, working on environmental campaigns. So that increased cooperation, great, but actually it changed the behaviour of the institutions. The Ministry of Economy took on Clear It Up's recommendations for the Mineral Resources Law, which is now in draft in Parliament. The Ministry of Environment took on Clear It Up's recommendations for management of water resources. So what we're seeing there is all different parts of society coming together and actually bringing about change. So it's not just a positive environmental impact, it's actually a positive good governance impact as well. And I think it's that sort of activity and that behaviour which is actually going to get all countries, including North Macedonia, to be able to build a sustainable green future. Mm -hmm.